My name's Chris Lewin, and I'm a physics engineer at EA Seed. I'm going to tell you about my investigations into real-time multi-physics simulation using the material point method. Specifically, I want to introduce the idea of combining position-based dynamics with MPM in order to have stable simulations at low frame rates. The simulations you see in this presentation were all simulated in real time and contain up to 500,000 particles. The 3D simulations are executed on the CPU in our internal framework Halcyon, and the 2D simulations are executed on the GPU in a framework that we're open sourcing. You can check out the project here and even run it in the browser right now if you want to. Before going into the specifics of these techniques, I want to talk a bit about the priorities we have in game physics simulation. It's well known that game physics simulations have to execute extremely quickly, but the most problematic requirement is actually stability. Game physics simulations have to happen completely autonomously, and usually the player has some kind of input into the simulation as well, which can potentially be very violent. This severely constrains the methods that we can use. Typically, rigid body simulation is the only kind of physics that is allowed to affect gameplay. This is not a great representation of the real world, because many common phenomena are not well represented as rigid bodies. So, one of the things I'm interested in as a games physics researcher is finding more general multi-physics simulation methods that are compatible with these restrictions, so that we can potentially have richer and more dynamic game worlds in the future. This is why I've been looking at NPM. While trying to adapt NPM for use in games, I managed to create a version of the algorithm that has a much higher degree of stability than standard explicit integration, while remaining just as easy to implement. I call this the position-based material point method, or PBMPM. But before describing that, I'll briefly recap standard NPM. Now, I don't have enough time to fully describe it NPM, and anyway, it's already been done very well by the SIGGRAPH course, which I'm more or less recapping here. Most descriptions of NPM start from continuum mechanics, which can make it rather intimidating, but I don't really think it's necessary to know this in order to use the method. So I'm going to offer a kind of quick colloquial description of how it works. I think for game physics techniques to be useful, they have to be comprehensible to an engineer with no special physics training. So I'm going to forego a lot of formalism here. Basically, in NPM, we discretize objects into particles that are like little blobs of matter that are equipped with an affine transform P and F. The F here is an arbitrary n by n matrix, where n is the number of dimensions that's similar to the rotation matrix of a rigid body, but can also contain scale and shear. The particle also has velocities, V and D, that correspond to each of these. Here I'm using displacements instead, which are just the velocities multiplied by the time step. So here I move the particle to the left and stretch it in the x-axis. Let's assume this particle has a simple elastic material, so it should resist being stretched and push its transform back towards the identity matrix. We're going to generate some forces that push back against this stretching and add them to the affine displacement. So depending on the stiffness, we'll generate some displacement like this that tries to squash the particle back down again. Then we can integrate the transform forward using these equations. So that's pretty much a simplified view of the way we evolve particle deformations in NPM. But I missed out the other part of the method, which is that there's an extra step involved that allows particles to communicate between each other. The particles transfer their mass and momentum to a background grid, where it's combined with the momentum of other particles. Then we divide by the total mass to get a consistent velocity field throughout the grid. We then transfer this back to the particles and we can proceed with integration as before. So here's the full update for one time step of an explicit material point method implementation. Explicit integration is easy to implement, but it suffers from cascading explosions. This means we can require very small time steps to get stability. Explosions are particularly an issue when the user has some violent input into the simulation, like I'm doing with my mouse here. To get the stiff behavior we need many materials to have, we often need to make our forces quite nonlinear, and this further increases their susceptibility to exploding when some user interaction pushes them far away from equilibrium. When doing real-time simulations, we often turn to position-based dynamics to avoid these stability issues. 
In this method, we represent materials as infinitely strong constraints that can be relaxed if necessary to get soft behavior. The big advantage of this is that we can solve constraints exactly and never overshoot. This makes it much more stable than explicit and even some implicit integration methods. So in regular or Lagrangian PBD, we have particles connected with constraints, and we go over the constraints and solve them one by one in a loop. This is typically presented as directly modifying positions, but we can easily reformulate it to modifying displacements instead. So let's assume we have some particles that are connected by a constraint that we want to remain at some rest length. If this constraint is violated, then we can figure out a momentum conserving update to the displacements of each particle that will exactly solve the constraint. In this case, we can easily solve the constraint analytically, but for more complex constraints, we can step along the constraint gradient using this method given in the position-based dynamics paper by Muller et al. So how can we apply this approach to NPM particles? Similarly to the Lagrangian PBD case, we can adjust the velocity such that the constraints are satisfied. This procedure replaces the calculation of forces that we would do in an explicit integrator with a calculation of updates to the particle's velocities that maintain the relevant constraints. The rest of the NPM update loop looks exactly the same as the explicit integration case. Let's have a look at a simple example of constraint resolution. Let's say, as before, we have a particle that's stretched in the x-axis. Its affine transform is going to look like this. Let's say it has an infinitely stiff elastic material. So we need to change its velocity so that its affine transform will become an identity matrix after integration. We can substitute into the integration equation to work out what we need to do to the deformation displacement in order to make this happen at the end of the time step. So in this case, we need to add some impulses that act to compress the particle in the x direction. This is the only change we need to make to an implementation of explicit NPM to turn it into PBD. It's just a few lines of code. You can see the difference between the implementations is small. We run the constraint solving and grid transfer operations in a loop, and this allows to continuously refine a deformation displacement for each particle. So here's a simulation based on the constraint I just showed you. We can see there's clearly something wrong with it. It looks like ghost forces are preventing the blocks from rotating. The problem here is this constraint, where we're choosing to drive the transform towards the identity matrix. This causes the body to resist rotation. This is an old problem in solid mechanics simulation that we can solve using a tool called the Singular Value Decomposition, or SVD. With the SVD, we can decompose the transform into a rotation and scale part. We can get the nearest rotation to F by just dropping the scale. Then if we want the object to be rigid, we can just drive it towards this rotation. We can rearrange as before to figure out the displacement required to get to this state. With this change, we can see the cubes are nice and bouncy. Here's a similar constraint for liquids. In this case, we only care about the volume, and we know we need to push outwards from each particle to keep it uncompressed. We can approximate the volume after our impulse is applied, and then solve the resulting equation for alpha to figure out what impulse we need to add. Here's what this looks like. I should note that liquids tend to lose a lot of volume over time when using standard NPM deformation tracking. So it helps to mix in some objective measurement of the volume of each particle, which we can also get from the grid. You can see when I turn this correction off, the liquid quickly loses volume, and then it springs back when I turn it on again. The main advantage of PBD over explicit integration is better stability. So let's look at the difference here. You can see that when I simulate these elastic blocks with NPM, with PB NPM, they're nice and stable. But when I switch to explicit NPM and do something violent to them, they start disintegrating because the forces are too large. Explicit integration can be just as stiff as PBD because both methods transport information around the sim at the same rate. However, a set of stiffnesses that give good results in one situation may cause a cascading explosion in another situation. And it's actually not easy to tell what the appropriate stiffnesses are for a given situation. On the other hand, PBD has behavior that is highly dependent on resolution, time step, and solver convergence. This is very bad if we're trying to do predictive science, but in games, the stability is more important. Now, what I'm presenting here is PBD and not XPBD, so we have no fine control over the stiffness of our materials. 
we can have some control using relaxation factors, as you can see in the top video. But the main thing that determines the stiffness of materials is the time step and iteration count. It would be pretty easy to do an XPBD variant of NPM, but for this work I was mainly interested in how stiff I could make things given the computational budget that we have, and XPBD would not make any difference to that. In PBD terms, what I've constructed would be considered a Jacobi-style solver because the impulses are combined by averaging them on the grid. This is not as efficient as a gauss seidel style solver where impulses are solved sequentially and information can propagate more quickly throughout the domain. The convergence can be much faster with a gauss seidel style solver, which can allow us to hit much higher stiffnesses. I actually implemented this prototype serial solver, and it allows for much higher over-relaxation of liquids that ends up conserving volume much better. But I haven't done it on the GPU yet. You can see in the bottom video that this column of liquid under heavy gravity can conserve much more volume when using the gauss seidel style solver. One of the strengths of NPM is that it can do really good plasticity, and it turns out it's easy to get a nice effect using the same techniques you can use in the explicit case. You can just modify your integration step a little bit to forget some of the deformation that's occurred. If we clamp the singular values of each particle's transform when integrating forward, we can forget any deformation over a certain limit. This lets us have plastic behavior without storing any extra data. If we correct the volume at the same time by dividing by the determinants before and after the clamp, then we can ensure this plastic flow is volume preserving. This is all we need to know, we, all we need to make this kind of pleasing Play-Doh material. We can also easily couple PBMPM with traditional PBD by just storing constraints that span between particles, such as these distance constraints, and solving them at the same time we solve the MPM particle constraints. These are binary constraints that will end up affecting the particle linear velocities <clears throat> rather than their deformation velocities. We can then resolve all these velocities through the grid as usual. If we make these particles exert some positive pressure in the same way as the liquid particles, then we can get self-collision essentially for free. So let's take a step back and evaluate what I've presented. Basically, I've shown that we can use PBD to create a variant of NPM that is free of the force explosions that happen with explicit integration, which is critically important for use in games. The version that I've shown uses Jacobi-style constraint resolution, which is the most natural choice to combine with the NPM grid transfers. But this limits the convergence speed of the method, and we can struggle to get enough rigidity in the kinds of performance budgets we would have in a real game. This means that for 3D games that are not focused around physics, this method is probably still too slow for casual use. To overcome this additional problem, it makes sense to look further into gauss seidel style solvers and probably also into slightly cheaty solutions like shape matching that store some extra rest pose information about objects. However, there is a whole world of smaller indie games based on physics that are often 2D. I think with GPU execution and a bit of basic optimization, the techniques I presented here could be used today to make some fun gameplay. So perhaps someone in that field will be able to make use of this work. Uh, so that's the end of my talk, and I'd like to mention that Seed is hiring in particular. Uh, I'm looking for a physics engineer to come and work with me on stuff like this. So if you'd like to come and do that, then please let me know. And uh, just one more reminder to check out the code. It's on GitHub, and uh, there's a free web demo that you can play with. Uh, it's designed to be easy to understand and fun to play with, so please check it out.